Elhamdülillah, nehmeduhu subhanehu ve nesta'inuhu ve nesta'gfiruhu ve nesta'hdihu ve na'udhu billahi min şururi enfusina ve min seyyiyyati a'malina men yehdillahu fela mudilla leh ve men yudlil fela hadiya leh ve la havla ve la kuvvete illa billahil aliyyil azim ve eşhedü en la ilahe illallah vahdahu la şerike leh ve eşhedü enne Muhammeden abduhu ve rasuluhu وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحابته خير ما صليت على عبد من عبادك اللهم اجزي عنا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جزيت بي نبيا عن قومي ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائي وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا أما بعد We are continuing to track the sources of power that Allah has bestowed upon us as an ummah and last time we were talking about one of the elements of unity which is the unity of history. And as the Quran repeatedly tells us that the stories of the prophets were told to us in the Quran so that we can take lessons and so that it can ferment our faith. So Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu that he is telling him these stories for a reason. لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فؤادك. So that the Qur'an and the stories the Qur'an bring forth will ferment your faith in your heart and will establish a steady stream of behaviors and actions that help you build a community with a future. And alhamdulillah, the Prophet وسلم, has completed his message and has accomplished his mission now it is on us to carry on forward where the Prophet وسلم, and our previous generations left us. They left us much better than where we are today. But unfortunately, some generations laxed and lagged behind and they left our Ummah in the lowest low of the bits. And it is on us to uplift our Ummah from where it is into a better future. That's why we talk about history. That's why we point to history as a very, very essential element of our unity. People see our history with one eye, that this is the history of Islam and Muslims. Some people see it as a history of bloody gang groups. Some others see it as the window into the next human civilization, which is the Islamic civilization that taught the world all the things we know and many things that we do not know. So we need to study our history to track our children into areas that still humanity is in need for. And I'm not only talking about material science and chemistry, some communities are very advanced in this, and we need to catch up with them. But our Ummah needs to give the world the gift of faith, the gift of mercy, the gift of compassion, the gift of knowledge, and the gift of good, positive relationship with Allah, our Creator. That is where we are lagging. For our own interests as an Ummah, materially, we are also lagging in many material issues. We are way behind in physical science, in medical science, even in math and other things. But Alhamdulillah, there is now a generation that is coming up to catch up in these fields. But again, that is going to help our Ummah catch up where we are lagging medically, physically, scientifically. But what we need the most is to catch up 
where the companions of the Prophet ﷺ left off. They left us with faith that is stronger in their hearts and more believable in their mind and hearts than the material things they have achieved. We need to achieve the same. So last time we talked a bit about our joint history as Muslims and one of the issues we raised is reclaiming our history. Our history has been written by colonial powers over the years and we need to reclaim it, we need to rewrite it, we need to uh, start putting together what our history means for us and for humanity in general. We know that, as we mentioned last time, Europe was way behind the Muslim world when Muslims were taking over Spain, southern France, Vienna, all of these European towns and cities were blessed by the coming of Muslims to carry to them the light of civilization. Even so much so that cleanliness and hygiene and brushing your teeth, all of this was not known in Europe. So let us not look back at only what others tell us who we were without looking at where they were and where we have been before they caught up. Unfortunately, when we started to dispute after Allah had enabled the Muslims at that time to get control over Southern Europe, still we went into disputes. And disputes produce disunity and this unity produces failure. After you had disputed and you started to dispute the matters, this is where failure comes in. So the Quran, where it talks to us about the reasons that we need to follow to succeed and the reasons we need to avoid so that we avoid failure, it is talking reality. The unfortunate thing is, some people think that looking at the Qur'an itself is backward. I'm talking about Muslims. They think that reading the Qur'an, studying the Qur'an, memorizing the Qur'an, the old ways, the katatib, the, the study circles, and so on and so forth, it will take us back hundreds of years. While it is the reason that we climbed the ladder of civilizations before Europe was the Europe that we know today. So we need to reclaim our history. We need to rewrite our history with our own expert historians and people who specialize in those studies. And we need to reclaim our place among the nations, not by words, not by glorifying the past. It's meaningless. We need to teach it to our children not to flag it in the face of others. We need to reclaim the glorious days when a Muslim scholar was also a physician. Some of them were carpenters, like many prophets were carpenters. Many prophets were uh, raising and grazing sheep and camels. We need to understand and our children to understand that doing hand work itself is of a great value. Now we are teaching our children the opposite, that you have to be someone on a desk, and this is the ultimate win. But that's not how the West is advancing, nor it is how we Muslims advanced in the past. If I have the time, I would take you through names upon names of scholars who used to do their own businesses, and they used to develop their own stuff. Imam al-Shafi'i, for example, he studied medicine before he studied Sharia, or parallel to his study of Sharia. And when he started, like at 12 years old, he was sitting giving fatwa. He was giving fatwa at 12. So those people had great blessings from Allah, and they put the effort to harvest those blessings. We need to do the same. Also, we need to own our own history. Own it means to take the positive and the negative together. Build on the positive and avoid the negative. Yes, Muslims of the early generations ended up fighting one another. 
but we need to study. Why did they fight? What was the issues? We should not shy away from studying our history because this is how we learn. As we mentioned last time, there are four types of people regarding history. People who never study history, they don't care to learn history. People who study history but learn nothing. People who study history and they learn some lessons. And the fourth group are the people who make history. This is where we need to be. We need to make history that our next generations will be happy to say, yes, these were our forefathers. We need to build the glorious days of the past into our community through our efforts and through our contribution to the world civilization. So owning our history also means that we need to focus on lessons learned. It was not a good idea for Muslims to fight no matter what the cause was. But until today, Muslims are still fighting each other, no matter how trivial the cause is. And we need to learn some lessons. We need to stop those blood shedding. The Prophet وسلم, says, لا ترجعوا بعدي كفارا يضرب بعضكم رقاب بعض. I don't know if I told you the story or not, but uh, in 19, I think it was 86 or 87, Jim Baker III, the Secretary of State of the United States, was trying to mediate a peace, a ceasefire and a peace treaty between Iran and Iraq, who have been fighting for years. You know the war of the 80s between the two countries. And sitting in Geneva for about 13 hours of negotiations, he came up with nothing. And as he was walking out of the meeting, the press were crowding the whole way that he could not move. So he stood to take questions. And the first question was, did you conclude anything? He said, yes. And people were anxious to know what was the agreement. He said, we concluded to let them finish each other off. This is not something that I read about or someone told. I saw that conference with my own eyes on TV, life. So if this is what we do to each other, how could anyone else help us? Why should they help us? Why should they? If we like it the way it is, they will actually let us finish each other off. The war in Yemen is another example. The war in Libya is another example. The war in Syria is another example. The fight in Iraq is another example. Does each one of those wars have reasons behind it? Of course. Does everybody find justifications? Of course. But does the bloodshed help any party other than the one who wants us finished off with our own hands, with our own resources, at the expense of our own blood, and they are watching. Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, was once asked as to, why don't you do this to Iran? Why don't you do this to Iraq? Why don't? And he says, if my two enemies are fighting each other, why should I interfere? They are doing my job for me. He's right. We are doing the job of our enemies for them. So we need to look back and stop every stupid war there is. And this is not on the rulers to do. Because the rulers have their own agenda. And I don't want to get into this area because we all educated, we all know what's going on. But it is on the people. It is on me and you to speak and speak loud enough until our voices penetrate and sink in by the force of the collective power of our communities. We need to stand up against what is wrong, even if it is done, and especially if it is done by our own hands, against one another, to the benefit of our enemy, and to the detriment of our interest. 
So we have to wisen up, we have to mature as an ummah. So reclaiming our history and re-owning our history doesn't mean sitting down, study the history and say this was wrong, this was right. Let us follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Do not go back into kufr, chopping each other's heads. لا ترجعوا بعد كفارة يضرب بعضكم رقاب بعض. Don't do it. This is enough lesson from the history that we should stop the fight. Does this mean that people who are oppressed should give up to the oppressor to stop the fight? No, they should defend. They should defend their right. But we need to stop the aggressor. This is what the Quran says. وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا فَإِنْ بَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِيءَ إِلَى أَمْرِ اللَّهِ If two Muslim communities started fight against each other, try to reconcile between the two sides. And if one of them, after reconciliation, commit aggression, fight the aggressor. What we're seeing is people see the fight and they support the aggressor. This must stop. We must start saying no to tyrants and regimes that are destroying our resources, that are shedding our own blood with our own money for the benefit of our enemies. We need to stop that. And we know who they are. And we need not to get into the details of this. So as we re-own our history, we should not waste our time fighting those who are telling us how miserable our history has been because it has been in some way. Our history is not all white as Muslims, but it is much better than any empire history. Any history of any empire can never come close in terms of humanity, in terms of values, in terms of bloodshed, in terms of any criteria you use. Muslims have performed the best, even being merciful to their enemies. It has been the best ummah that Allah spoke about. We should also look for inspirations from our history. Our history has lots of things to be proud of. Those, unfortunately, have been submersed by the glorious Western civilization at the expense of hiding and concealing where this civilization came from. Allah has written it in the Quran that people will inherit civilizations from each other. The Roman Empire perished, then came the Muslim Empire, the Persian Empire, also the Muslim Empire, if you will, which was never, never an empire, but the Khilafah Islamiyah, when they took over, they kept the best and they added to it. When Muslim civilization started to wane down and Muslims started to fight each other and dispute and defeat themselves, Europe started to pick up to build on what we have produced. So we need to pick from wherever people have reached anywhere and start building a new form of humanistic civilization in which values of justice, values of compassion, values of humanity, values of ethics start to take hold alongside the value of scientific discoveries and scientific achievements. So we need to take some inspirations from our history. As we know, uh, Muslims are the ones who studied the algebra. Muslims are the ones who started the invention of lenses. Muslims are the ones who started surgical tools and surgical operations. There is a lot one can say, but suffice it to know that the, all the foundation of experimental empirical research were laid down by Muslim scientists 
in the early ages, when Europe was in the mid medieval era, Muslims were at their peak. So it was medieval for Europe, but not for us. So this is something about history that I'm hoping it will inspire some of us, at least some of our children, to study history. People who are drawing the maps of the Middle East today and have been drawing it for years are people who studied two things, history and religion. Huntington, Bernard Lewis, these people studied history and religions. And on this, these grounds, they look back and say, this is what you, America, could do. This is what you, Britain, could do. And the nations start doing their bidding because they come up with studies, they come up with research, they come up with ideas. On our end, we are focusing on study, engineering and medicine and IT and all of that, and we're forgetting that those are lower tools. The higher tools are tools that give you the power as a community, that give you the power as an ummah. That is the study of history, the study of culture, the study of religion, the study of how nations turn nations around, up or down. And these are the fields that I hope that some of our children will pick up. Now, moving to the second element that I would like to share with you that should help us bring full unity among us, our ummah, is the issue of language. I cannot spend my time talking about how articulate the Arabic language is because this is a whole field of study and discussion, but suffice it to say that the Arabic language is one of the oldest languages in the world. And it is the richest language without competition in terms of vocabulary, in terms of expressions, in terms of articulation, in terms of examples, history, poetry, the Arabic language is a wealth in and of itself. So how could the Arabic language be used today as a divider when it is supposed to be a uniter? It's supposed to unite us. When every community clinches into their own local language, the Arabic language becomes useless because it's not used for daily anything. It's not even used for the study of religion. And many of the Arabic, non-Arabic Muslim communities around the world are trying their best to study the Arabic, but it's only limited to scholars. It's not a mass movement. It does not transform a community into a real Muslim community that understands fully its faith, its book, what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what we need is a movement inside the Ummah whereby those who know the Arabic language march like armies armed with the language itself to teach anybody who wants to learn the Arabic language. And I said this before, I will repeat it. Imagine if you want to enjoy Shakespeare. Do you want to read Shakespeare in Russian? Or do you want to read it in English, right? But if you even read Shakespeare in the current English, you will not understand it. So you need to go to the language as it was when he wrote his books. So we need to be cognizant, we need to be aware that we have to go back to the classic Arabic language in which the Quran was revealed to the Prophet to learn our deen first hand. Any translation is a second hand rendering of the Quran. Do you want Allah to talk to you in a second hand? Through a human filter? Somebody says, this is what it means, I will put it this way. Another person says, this is what it means, not that. This is why you have to read my translation. This is a divider now. It is not a uniter. 
So we have to go back to the study of the Arabic language if we want to understand our deen firsthand. This doesn't mean that those who do not know the Arabic language cannot be Muslims or cannot study Islam. They will, and they will understand it. But again, reading anything in a second-hand translation means you are just reading a second-hand translation. It is not the original. And do you know how the books of previous nations, the Christians and the Jews, the Old Testament and the New Testaments, how they turned around and was diverted from what they were? It is through translation. It is through translations. So if we want the Quran also to be lost, let us focus on translations and beat one against the other and choose one and then say, this is better than all, then people would rely on this translation but not the Arabic. So the Arabic will become strange. It's like today, who speaks Aramaic today? Aramaic was the language of Prophet Isa salam. He spoke Aramaic. So who is talking Aramaic today? How many people? You count them. You count them. Where did it go? How did it disappear? It's because it was not kept. And it was not made a living language that people use for everyday stuff. So if we turn our life into, even in the Arabic land today, in the Arab world, which is the heart of the Muslim world, people are preferring to use foreign languages in daily affairs rather than using Arabic. You see on shop names and uh, product promotions and advertisements, all in foreign language. Why? Because it looks like that surrender to the foreign language is part of the plan of stripping Muslims from their sources of power. Arabic is a powerful language. Without it, whatever language we use, it's much less. We lose that source of power which should produce unity in the Muslim Ummah. So, language produces culture. And languages are used to express the faith of any community. So, if our faith needs translation to be understood, because nobody is using the language of the faith, then our faith will be a second-hand faith. Then for generations after us, it will not be used altogether it will be lost. And you will be hardly finding a copy of the Quran in Arabic. If it were not for Allah promising to keep this book, this book would have been lost. But Allah did not entrust it, its keeping to anyone. Because he entrusted the Old Testament or the Torah, he entrusted the Injil to the people, they did not keep it. So he decided to keep this book, the final book, by himself. So the original is kept. But to understand it, at least we have the tools of the language. We must have these tools to understand what the book is saying. Abandoning the Arabic and using other languages for daily communication, for daily exchange of materials and money and everything, will render the Arabic as useless language. When any language becomes useless, it is a threat that this language will fade away, will disappear, and the community that used to speak it will also disappear. So the language is not a secondary issue. It is a central issue. We know that Latin-based languages in Europe, which is almost all the languages in Europe, are Latin-based. They are having difficulty unifying their communities because of multiple languages, multiple faith denominations, even though they are mostly more or less Christians. But now, 
Why do people divide? Language plays a role. They say, this is what this means. The others say, no, that's not what it means. This is what it means. Then they divide. Are we heading in the same direction? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned us, saying, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيعًا لَسْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ those who divided their faith into groups and denominations, you have nothing to do with them. You have no relationship with them. Are we going to speak second and third languages together as even Arabs who know the Arabic? The answer to this, look at home. Look at home. Children speak English because it is a dominant language at school. Then they come home and the parents speak to them in English because this is what the kids understand, right? So the parents are forced to learn from the children the English language so that they can communicate with them. What happens to the Arabic language? The father is an Arab, the mother is an Arab, they can speak Arabic very well with each other, but to accommodate the kids, they are speaking English. Where is the Arabic going? The Arabic is fading away. This is very dangerous. There is a very strong connection between faith, religion, culture, and language. The language that carries the tenets of faith, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the language that people should love. But what happens in the Muslim world is, we love the language that gives us the gold, the silver, the iPhone, the IT, all of the modern tools. We love the language that gives us tools for life, but we don't pay attention to the language that gives us the tools to survive the challenges of this life. I think I'll stop here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our hearts to do what is best. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us our history in the right way and give us the lessons to learn from our history. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala ali wa sahabi wa man wala, wa ba'd. Brothers and sisters, it is sad that we know the diseases and we know the cure and the treatment and we are satisfied reiterating those and not doing what we need to do. So at Dar al-Hijra, a few months ago, we started a program for teaching Arabic for non-Arabic speakers. And Alhamdulillah, we have about 25 students now, but I'm sure we have much and many more people than 25 who should be learning the Arabic, including the Arabs. Including the Arabs. Especially those who have lived long away from their country and away from the language and have set themselves up to only use English as the dominant language in their life. So please, the next registration is coming in the summer. Please check on the registration and deadline and register and encourage someone else to register. And if you don't have the money, which is peanut, $50 for one semester, right? Ask and you will be helped. But do not waste a day without speaking Arabic. Do not waste a day without learning Arabic. Do not waste a day without using the Arabic. This is the language that Allah has chosen for his book and for his prophet and for our community. It's a bond that we should never let loose. It's a bond we should never let loose. اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت 
اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تؤون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم اشف مرضانا ومرضى المسلمين وارحم موتانا وموتى المسلمين واكشف الهم والغم عن المهمومين اللهم اجب دعاء المطالبين اللهم اشف جميع مرضى المسلمين اللهم اختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة